Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the another edition of the Resident Smart Learning Program. Today we have a very interesting topic: disorders of sexual differentiation. A topic which is not discussed very often. And we have an accomplished reconstructive surgeon, Dr. Sanjay Pandey, from the Kokila Ben Hospitals in Mumbai, who will be taking us through this topic. It's a very complex topic, but I am sure Sanjay's experience. will make it very interesting and will stimulate the juniors and the residents who are listening to you to him today and with this opening remark i would now invite dr rajiv sood chairman indian school of urology to give his opening remarks over to you dr rajiv thank you dr keshav this is another uh, distant le uh, resident learning program part of that and we have i mean very very eminent uh, Uh, faculty today and uh, and the master of uh, of of the subject and craft of uh, evaluating and also giving the best possible results of uh, sexual uh, differentiation problems he has been uh, interested in the subject for last two decades and performing as doctor explained by doctor uh, um, keshav he is uh, teaching the other other craft people also uh, the master people uh, he is the teacher of them also for for uh, um, spreading the knowledge of uh, this subject actually he has conducted many workshops and his patients are uh, also per, um, um, performing in the in in the, in the uh, Um, glamour world also uh, after after getting uh, uh, operated and treated in his uh, able hands and uh, for the residents this uh, subject is very very important this is uh, a subject is very important for uh, now um, their theory exams their final exams and also in surprises what they get in the Um, clinics when uh, they have to take on the spot decision they should be fully aware about all the aspects of this uh, important aspect of the clinical uh, training and practice and therefore we welcome today dr uh, uh, sanjay pande from kokila ban and also dr pande is going to interact with all the uh, residents and uh, faculty and the chat box is open at the end dr uh, arun chavla the co chair of indian school of urology is uh, going to take all the questions or queries or comments which are uh, extended in this program and uh, let us we live with the dr sanjay pande who is taking teacher teaching lessons today thank you Thank you, Professor Sood. Now I would invite Dr. Arun Chawla to introduce the speaker and moderate this session. Over to you, Dr. Arun. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It's indeed a great privilege to introduce Dr. Sanjay Pandey to you all. Uh, briefly, I'll just uh, introduce in few words. Dr. Sanjay Pandey is MSc from Jipner Pondicherry, and after his urology residency, he joined as faculty. in srm c chennai there he remained for 6 to 7 years with a keen interest in neurology and reconstructive surgery he went to many fellowship programs the one was at youth reconstruction and arizo italy with guido barbagli a fellowship in general reassignment surgery at belgrade serbia and a general reconstructive surgical course at hamburg germany In professional front, Dr. Sanjay Pandey has won many awards and honors. MIUC Traveling Fellowship from USA, where he went to uh, Germany. Professor Krishna Swami gold medal for a counterpoint debate, counterpoint debate at the under under the ages of uh, Association of Surgeons Urology, and Krishna Swami gold medal for the best uh, scientific paper under the ages of uh, the Pasukon. He is very passionately involved in the reconstructive surgeries, gender assignment surgeries, and his area remains genitourinary reconstruction and andrology. 
that's why he is here today with us with the topic of disorder of sexual transition now this topic usually is not covered by the faculty in the various institutions the surgeries are limited as majority of the surgeries are referred to the institute of repute or to the master craftsman like that sanjay mande who frequently does this, this type of surgeries and there are few centers who are actually involved in these type of surgeries and i am sure with the type of uh, uh, presentation skill set of the sanjay pandey has and the type of uh, uh, presenting skill he has it will be uh, a great uh, uh, to watch and to listen to him today in this uh, uh, class uh, we will open with his lecture which will be followed by a uh, question and answer from the chat box and uh, which will be followed with the link will be open and you can attempt your quiz followed and followed by the clo closing remarks from the secretary on the secretary usa and uh, dr ajay shuth uh, chairman i issue uh, with this i'll just hand over and invite dr sanjay pandey for his uh, class on disorders of sexual differentiation over to you sir sanjay very good evening to you uh, dr chavla thank you for your kind words respected dr keshav murthy respected rajiv suit sir thank you so much for the encouragement uh, as teachers in this country on the subject uh, urology which has now moved from a to z uh, the way we have been taught and tutored my colleagues uh, in the audience respected teachers and colleagues who are uh, taking up this subject of reconstruction which actually broadens itself to many aspects around uh, opening the subject today uh, uh students and to classmates is from team reasons and just to give you a little idea that all may not be able to be covered in this subject because wanted to take more questions and open up the larger subject which we do in reconstruction the topic given to us disorders of sexual differentiation thankfully it is time to take it to the very front row seat and thank you uh, usi isu smart program which actually brings this to all of us and probably helps us take this subject to the next level so friends while we move forward on this subject uh, i carry greetings from uh, abin dirbambani hospital and from team urology uh, at coclaven hospital where colleagues really make it a multifactorial and multidisciplinary team and that is very important to stress on subjects of reconstruction where all the teams are visible today uh, on this platform and around look at this important aspect of identifying redefining reexamining reevaluating going back to the subject looking at your own algorithms and your own log books and seeing what we do and that's what the team does so projecting the team and saluting the team 24/7 who actually work around on various aspects of reconstruction like we saw few of them today morning and we could take it forward to very high levels on aspects that we take it forward friends the global threat is not over yet and the crossroads are still there we're talking about another important crossroad today which could be on the day of birth on the day of birth what is the first question asked by by anybody by the grandparents by parents or by peers or even by the doctor who delivers is this a male child or a female child that's the first question nobody asks about the body weight and about the health and the color but they ask about is it a male and a female we may not be doing pediatrics as our, our colleagues do or we may not be gynecologists but as urologists though we stand a little behind and watch the whole story we look at this important question of assigning the sex on the day of birth and it's such an important aspect so the first question asked is about this child and all children is it a male child or a female child and when you look at the external genitalia and there's something missing it gives an idea that there could be something missing somewhere and the very important question goes down does it mean that this is another crossroads and imagine this crossroads on the day of the birth of a child that means if a doctor can't say that it's a male or a female child as a child is born and if the parents run this dilemma on the very day they should celebrate most that is the emergency the emergency that we may not have known a social emergency of a kind which we are waking up to it as a subject which we are attempting to probably conquer and captivate and compactly cure this condition around because it spreads it spreads on both directions around so let's look at that subject which is a social emergency of some kind the dreams get shattered and it becomes completely upside down what was a dream to a reality when you get a child who is born the day and you can pick it up 
I also did mention about it could be from the day of birth to probably being picked up very late in adolescence and even in adulthood. So let's look at the subject which actually spans decades of pickup. And therefore, the most important slide as an academic slide for the subject to roll on, and we need to discuss this in very ways. The very important chronology of events which brings about the maturation or a very conception of sexual activity are parameters which are looked into and they have got the strict timelines and therefore the criteria which makes it forward. Let's look at this uh, slide, take it academically for colleagues, students who are peers and who will be practitioners of the art tomorrow. The first five parameters, chromosomal sex, which is on the moment of conception. That is, you are assigned at the moment of conception whether you are XX or XY and it oh, completely changes around. Thereafter, in the first five weeks, you still have got a bipotential or a waiting gonad. But from the sixth week onwards, you have got these gonads being differentiating into either a male or a female structure. And that's where the HY antigen or the SRY gene will come into picture. The first three months is about production of internal genitalia or creation of internal genitalia, which on the active path on the male side will be testosterone and mullerian inhibiting substance or the AMH, the anti-mullerian hormone coming from the testis. The external genitalia on the first six months will be about tissue receptors and the activity of these productions which happen from the testis in terms of activities and their product products like the 5-DHT are very important component. And then we look at the sex hormone pattern, which is from the time of fetal life till the level of menarche by pulsatile and non-pulsatile changes of LH and FSH and supported by the maternal hormones, which gradually change as the child gets born. So these five important criteria for determination of the sex, which happen in a very chronological order, decides the entire fate of this child, which is born out of this wedlock. Any abnormality in the first five factors leads to a development of what is now called as a DSD, or the older term called ambiguous genitalia, which is being shifted now to atypical genitalia. The first five criteria are very timed. They're week by week and hour by hour, they're timed around. That the subject has its ramifications and that this academic slide talks about it. Let's also discuss, there is something called as pattern of behavioral center, which is both prenatal and perinatally, which has, has its sex dimorphic differentiation going on. Then there is something called a sex of assignment and rearing. And we'll come to that and we'll come to Indian scenarios where the imprinting happens so much by environment. By the environment in which a girl wears a kind of a dress called by a name, goes to a different kind of school. And that whole imprinting happens by the environment she lives in and she studies in. And finally, the psychosexual differentiation, which is a lifelong differentiation that gives them the identity or the gender identity. The last three criteria respond to correspond to something called as abnormalities of which lead to gender dysphoria, a subject which is not being discussed today, but the ramifications just move very parallel on the bridge of the same subject. So we're looking at two different happenings today. We're looking at the topic of the day, which is disorders of sexual dysfunction, uh, differentiation, and also looking at if there's anything going beyond it, which is all brain wiring gone wrong somewhere, you would look at something called as gender dysphoria, where pattern of behavioral center, the sex of assignment and the sex of rearing and psychosexual differential, a lifelong phenomena, brings changes in the identity and brings about a gender dysphoria. So the subject, as rightly said by our secretary, is a difficult subject. And as colleagues in urology, we may not be the first movers on the subject on day one of the child being born or diagnosed. We possibly get this as referrals, but we, that we practice in umpteen locations, which is a solo practice, an academic practice, a corporate group practice. We look into this subject as a subject which deserves that kind of an empathy to take it forward. Friends, last day of every February is a rare disease day. And this important aspect of atypical genitalia and DSD does not fall into these rare diseases. That means it must be common. It's rated in literatures and text, the text that we read, uh, one in 4.5 to 12,000 live births. So it's something, somewhere in that age group, somewhere in that kind of scenario, you get to see this. We look at just stratifying this and looking at various world figures around. Have a look at the kind of picture I did paint. It's 2.2 in 10,000 live births or what is now talk as one in 4,500 to 7,000 live births of an atypical genitalia of presentation. The congenital adrenal hyperplasia is anything between 1 and 16,000 live births in the recorded figures or the registries and data available. The congenital vaginal atresia, which does not present on the day of birth, 
but sadly will present as a hematocorpus uh, somewhere uh, at the time of puberty. It will be one in 40,000 live female births. And the MR Cage syndrome, which is absence of both uterus and the vagina, again divided into two different subsets, is one in, one in 20,000 live female births. That means the list could be endless. And possibly we can only see the tip of the iceberg in our lifetime as practitioners of the art. So these are the subjects which we got to see and I probably deal with all of them and my colleagues in reconstructive urology in this country uh, repeatedly deal with all these things at a very common location because it is now in public domain that they get to understand parents get to the right location and move forward. While we get into the academic aspect of it, we need to have an empathy on this because this is a problem of extreme complexity. Wish it was just another renal mass or probably a calculus which we could remove and clear them around. This is a very sensitive condition which starts from the day of birth. Their family is living through a very sensitive and stressful condition. It will gradually get transmitted to the child as a child grows, looks at himself, compares with his peers in his toddler years and school days, and finally grows and finds himself lesser capable than what could appear or his own brother or sister could be. So it is a transferable kind of a stressful condition on, a, on one side socially, but Medically, it has its ramifications where uh, a urologist, a colleague urologist would look into it and some teen, so many aspects of it. So let's look at the medical aspects of it is about main issues and sex assignment or affirmation of the sex. So that means we give them the right that they deserve it. And therefore, there's a right to this subject too. It should come as a fundamental right. And that's where we as urologist colleagues are involved in the subject, looking at assigning them and giving them that which possibly was not given on the day of birth or probably... Uh, God forget, forgot to give them the gift when he was distributing these gifts and the organs probably went wrong way. Problems could be too variable from too small an organ to too big an organ. It could be too less or too much. That means it could be one or many. It could completely be absent or it could be abundant or it could be deformed as a result of the growth patterns which happen as a result of the uh, hormones, as a result of the receptor activities. And then many things could be missed out by the family, by colleagues, and this possibly could be missed out because the awareness of this subject overall is, is quite missing because this has stayed so theoretical till we became the practitioners of the art. Friends, our recent understanding of DSD has undergone a paradigm shift from what we used to read in 5th edition of Campbell's Urology to what came in 10th edition. It's quite different. That means if you look at the books on one side, look at the understanding of the subject and then the very important laws of the subject in the, in the country, which India has moved forward compared to many other countries in the world. There's a paradigm shift. Therefore, we stand very tall today saluting the Urology Society of India and USI ISU program of this, where we are getting ourselves more aware on the subject. We'll take it forward from the unknowns of the past to real knowns that will take it forward. So looking at this disorder of sexual development or ambiguous genitalia is to discover that there's an uncertainty about the sex of the newborn baby, which is devastating and often incomprehensible to most parents. Paramount here as a clinician to us is just not knowing the subject but it's so important for us to look at the clear explanations that we need to give the peers and investigations that are very much comments there and that no attempt is made to guess the sex of the baby. You cannot guess it around just looking at it. Therefore, a multidisciplinary team and a tertiary care setup is a requirement and extreme sensitivity is required in using the terminologies and terms around. Understanding of sex determination and differentiation is essential to direct appropriate investigations and to establish a diagnosis. So my friends, you're moving up to the subject, very really gently looking at the fact file, a sensitive and stressful condition where the main issue for a urologist today is the sex assignment or looking at the handholding of the entire subject as a child matures into adolescence and adulthood. Decision is always confluence and influence. And that's where I need to come to because we have a stress across the table when we discuss with the caregivers, which are parents taking into consideration a lot of things because a same child could be a different child from a different cultural background, from a different sex of rearing, from the kind of clinical features we get to see in childhood compared to what happens in adolescence, the biochemical parameters, including hormonal studies and the imaging reports, some hormonal parameters and biochemical parameters can be very stressful. For example, the congenital adrenal hyperplasia with 11 hydroxylase deficiency where you're scared about a hypertensive episode or a 17 hydroxylase where you can have a gross kind of a, a crisis which can happen around. So we're going to look at those biochemical parameters and hormone studies at the right and appropriate time, number one. I mean, the bygones are bygones for the child and the, for the family. When, when you and I see it, it is there that we need to move the subject. We need to look at this important aspect where surgeries are so much decided by parental preference. 
we are the ones who actually give a transparent and a very proper advice. And we as a multidisciplinary team, but we look at the large picture of the child's future. We also look at the fertility potential and assessment of the mental makeup of the child if possible. And that's where India stands a little tall because we have a court ruling right now from the Madras High Court, which helps us to understand the subject more that we will not be operating everybody in childhood or on the day of birth. We have matured ourselves as urologists, as a society, and uh, we've been governed by the laws that we move forward on this very subject compared to gender dysphoria, which is huge and which actually has moved in the country so well. Friends, history is such an important aspect. I think we will just touch base a few, few things on this and history, 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 because when a child comes, we start examining, we start looking at the reports, but we sometimes miss out on this important what teachers in this audience have taught us. A family history and a family tree is such an important aspect. And that's where it comes something called as consanguinity. Consanguinity happens to be a practice in few parts of our country. And consanguinity in some centers can, can be as high as 10% of children being brought to a subject or to a, to a center. Where a pediatrician would look at consanguinity is 10% of children who have come today on a rota for various evaluations. When we look at the history of this important aspect, we need to go back to the maternal history and to the family history. We're looking at history of drugs, looking at history of medication, especially the serogenic preparations, including the oral contraceptive pills taken by the mother during pregnancy. These all have got their own activity and they all bring about changes which influences and therefore the time at which it influences during the pregnancy matters so much. We also take history of sibling death or for any unexplained neonatal deaths in the family which points towards possibly congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Sudden, sudden kind of a death of that kind of crisis which happened, both by hypertension or a crisis of the CH could be something which is known more in neonatal. History of fertility issues in parents, in grandparents, even in first degree relatives and also sometimes adoption issues matter a lot. So you look at this picture, we get to know that we need to go down and again start from A, B, C, D on the subject and look at, we find the missing link somewhere where the child presents at the day of birth or at adolescence or even later than that in adult. And the subject has moved on. So what's out and what's in? Important to look at the terminologies of this subject like any other subject. What's out are the words called intersex, pseudo-hermaphrodite and hermaphrodite and ambiguous genitalia. These terminologies have almost gone out. What has now come in is called DSD, which I'll explain to you how that terminology is opening up. And the term ambiguous genitalia has given way now to atypical genitalia. So we are being uh, we are looking at giving up extreme terminologies on the subject of sensitivity and real sensitivity. Friends, differences or disorder of sexual development is what probably came in around. And now they are actually looking at from a very peaceful way. The terminology should in due course of time should become differences in sexual differences which is possibly the, the terminology which is coming up, which means it talks about equal rights and no discrimination. So I was till now touching it, the subject with the, the larger picture of changes which have happened around. So we are approaching DSG towards care, towards QO, towards combating it and conquering it because it has evolved with the evidence that we have today and the kind of experience we have with the leaders who practice this and the expertise that has come in, timely to be doing the subject and to probably taking it forward on the kind of approach that we as urologists would take it forward. The need today in DSD is to understand the embryology, to understand the anatomy and the physiology, to finally be evaluating and managing our patients. And therefore, it is time to know when to suspect a DSD and when not to suspect a DSD. How to approach a 46XX DSD and how to approach a 46XY DSD. I think that is the crux of the entire aspect that we got to approach all this a little differently when we see them at that age group compared to somebody whom we see at a different age group. So the same child or the same patient bearing the same name becomes a different patient seen at a different point in time. Because there's so much in the mind and the body and the sex of rearing and the evaluation, which happens when they see the first, probably lost to follow up or probably seen a little later when they could come for the first time and the whole aspect changes. What is DSD by a practical definition? A practical definition of DSD could be a typical development of a genetic sex, a gonadal sex and an anatomical sex. What does it mean? What am I referring to when I look at this atypical development of genetic sex, gonadal sex, and an anatomic sex? I'm actually referring to the sexual characteristics of either the genetic XX or XY. I'm referring to the gonadal changes of testis or the ovary presence or absence. And I'm looking at the anatomic, the external and the internal genitalia as a sexual characteristics given to them. So any of this going wrong 
if they are having a typical development on the genital gonadal anatomical sex broadly is now labeled as differences or disorders of sexual development we talk about this word sex and as uh, uh, dr rajiv so did attribute to we need to look at this important aspect of undermining ourselves in defining the definition or differences between the sex and the gender and in the words of caldwell in 1979 sex is what one sees that means what do you have physically is what is sex what one feels internally that means something which is an innate uh, non negotiable entity which is a social attribute could happen very early in life or what the feeling is about placing oneself in our own surroundings and the society is called gender a topic of gender is not being discussed today but it is always a very big confusion as to which is what we are dealing with so are we dealing with the sex or dealing with the gender of it so sex is a physical attribute and the attributes were both genetic gonadal and anatomic anatomic is what we finally see and the gonadals are what is actually visualized by the way they are appreciated or they are defined so gender is all that once internal feeling of a non negotiability it is so look at that academic slide which is important for us to move on the embryology and look at the development i did talk about those five important criteria but we are today looking at a potential gonad or by potential gonad in the first five weeks the definition of a sry gene on the y chromosome actually brings about that important aspect what does it do it gives us an idea whether we will go to this direction or direction we will move to the blue line on the left or move to the right side of it so sry genes availability or presence actually brings about that important differentiation from 6 week onwards to be having a lineage or production of a definitive gonad called the testis not that the ovaries and the right side chain is a passive aspect of any more development it is very much an active singling pathway of creation of ovaries and the aspect that moves on the female cycle but that we are looking at the active cycle of sry gene and testis production and directly goes on to two important aspects the production of testosterone and the production of anti mullerian hormone or the mullerian inhibiting substance produced from the testis so let's go to the left side of the chain and look at the testosterone production which means once the testosterone is being produced there is maintenance of the wolfian ducts and the ductal anatomy therefore moves in which means we have got all those aspects being created internally which includes the ejaculatory ducts the vas deferens the prostate and that entire lineage of ductal activity internally could happen as a result of the wolfian duct activity so the testis brought about testosterone which brings about the maintenance of wolfian ducts which then matures into the ductal system of males internally which as i said was vas deferens seminal vesicles prostates ejaculatory ducts the entire aspect of that moves in that is the internal genitalia of the patient now the dht formation by 5 alpha reductase uh, activity is an important aspect which brings about the production of external genitalia and the external genitalial production is completely we looked into that aspect which i come to it now it means the genital tubercle converts itself into a glands in the male and actively could be going into clitoris in a female by a female mechanism the urogenital fold which is a part of the 5 ar cycle goes into the penile shaft as a lengthening and the genital swelling goes into the scrotal phenomenon the the, the the compatriots are the clitoris the labia minora and the labia majora so i did look at this important aspect of testis and the testosterone and the movement of wolfian ducts the ductal system and the dihydrotestosterone which actually brings about the production of external genitalia or the development and formation of it so this is the cascade of development which is instigated by the sry gene up on the 6th week let's look at the anti mullerian hormone or the mullerian inhibiting substance which brings about the obliteration of mullerian ducts and therefore in changes where the mis is on the lower side there could still be mullerian remnants is what we now know much better you look at the ovarian cycle it's no testosterone therefore wolfian ducts are obliterated and because there's no amh coming as a from the testes the mullerian ducts are maintained around and therefore the girls get their internal genitalia which is what moves forward and because there's no dht there's no active component producing a female genitalia and therefore the maturation of females into clitoris labia majora and labia minora though active is still minus the dht requirement so that was just to give you an idea how the testis and from testis the dye the file for reductase and from there the 
DHT and therefore the DHT related changes and all those have got their timelines. They're all happening anything between 6th to 13th week. Very important timeline. If that timeline is crossed and things not happen or that is influenced by various maternal activities or maternal external influences or her own overproductions or hormone changes are in, things can actually go wrong for her. So that's where these changes are something sensitively moving up the ladder on that first slide, which talked about the movement from the date of conception, moving down to the third and sixth month and to the date of delivery. So I can talk about in a nutshell in embryological parlance, gonadal development is lateralized. That means what happens on one side doesn't happen on the other. It's a paracrine mechanism. So one gonad could be a bigger one, other could be small and shrunken because of multiple aspects, both development or an intra-uterine accident. But let's look at that. If there is no SRY gene, there's no testicular development. If there's no testicular development, then you saw, the, you saw that there is no MIS or there was no malarian inhibiting substance and there is no testosterone. If there's no MIS, then the malarian structures remain. That means you could have uterus, you could have fallopian tubes, you could have upper vagina still available. So if the MIS is on the lower side, there's no MIS, then this could be a possibility. If there's no testosterone, there's no testosterone. That means we're talking about DESD now. There's no testosterone. Then there'll be no male ductal systems, which will be no epidermis, no seminal vesicles, no vas, and no prostates. So that's where we're waking up to a phenomenon. Of their presence brings about a cascade of instigation towards production of these important timeline structures, which grow mature under the influence of receptors and, and the hormones. If there's no DHT, then there's no male external genitalia development. So imagine how the cascade on the AMH side was. That means there is a DHT production from the testosterone and there's a that with the file for reductase. So file for reductase is a strong enzyme. It brings about those changes at that very point in time, immediately after SRY gene took over and gave us the testes. So that's no SRY, no testes, no testes, no MIS and no testosterone, no MIS, molecular structures continue to remain and you've got feminization inside. No testosterone, no male ductal systems, and if no DHT, no male external genitalia. So how much amount of changes can go in each direction as the flights could take off in each of these directions because of the very important aspect which happened in the fifth week. Now look at the sex steroid pathway, a very dreaded kind of a pathway on these hormones. We look at the hormones, especially the 21 hydroxylase, the 17 alpha hydroxylase, and the 11, 11 beta hydroxylase are important aspects in 46 XY. We'll come to that. So this is an important aspect which we need to be awake about and looking at that, that these changes bring about something very silently, which is picked up at birth, maybe missed out and sometimes picked up at adolescence and even adulthood. And I get to see the adolescence and adulthood because patients do present late. And that's where India does not live only in the cities of Chennai and Kolkata and Delhi and Mumbai and Madras, because it probably goes beyond. Many a times awareness is missing in clinician colleagues who are on a different rung and a different ladder, though they deal with these children much more faster. But we as clinicians ramifying this subject and taking it forward, get to see it unfortunately quite late. And whenever we get to see, we start again from history and clinical examination, move forward. While I talk about criteria that makes you suspect DSD, we're also looking at the examination of a child. A newborn child will have a different examination approach compared to a child with adolescence. And this growth is all about, again, a general physical examination. We don't go into details today. An examination of the external genitalia and looking at all that. So external genitalia examination moves in the direction of everything, the vision to the examination to the measurements, which talks about the phallic size, the clitoris size, the labia minora, the labio, labial fusions, looking at the scrotum, looking at the palpable gonads, looking at all those aspects which give us an idea as to what could be the large picture of that. Probably when you see in adolescence, you find more maturity and probably miss the boat too because the aspect has moved forward. But when you look at these uh, in a younger child, you probably can be hand-holding the journey in terms of uh, the endocrinology colleagues, in terms of the pediatric colleagues, and probably helping them out on many aspects. Now. But as a urologist, as a student today who would probably be appearing in exam, a clinician, uh, a teacher clinician on the opposite side of the table as an examiner would look at how safe am I to discuss this case in terms of NIC. So I will always look at, I am a part of a multifactorial, multidisciplinary team. I'd be very um, empathetic towards the parent, but look at the subject very strongly because I as a urologist will be handholding his pediatric, his adolescent, adolescence and his, his mature years too. And therefore, a student is expected today to be knowing when to suspect a DSD with a team or alone and to take it forward. Therefore, let's discuss the criteria for suspecting DSD. Number one is 
overt genital ambiguity like a cloacal dystrophy. That means it's clinically visible that you have a cloacal extrophy, everything is visible to you and you take it forward. Or it could be an apparent female genitalia with enlarged clitoris and a posterior labial fusion. Most commonly, is a congenital adrenal hypothesia, which presents with umpteen variants and also umpteen attempts at presentation from a milder form, which presents late in the adulthood or adolescence to a very, very aggressive form, which probably can even bring about a neonatal demise. So, apparent female genitalia, but enlarged clitoris and a posterior labial fusion could be pointing to a congenital adrenal hypothesia, one of the commonest aspects to look into. Apparent male genitalia with bilateral descended testis, a strong hypospadias, and a micro penis component. So if a male genitalia is visible and you've got all this in unison or otherwise individually, you're strongly suspecting that I'm dealing with something. If the mind doesn't know where it is to be seen, probably the eyes will never look at it and we miss out on that aspect. So therefore, the examination of history, going close to the patient, examining and talking has been a part of the karyotype of our own work of learning today to come to these levels. Discordance between the genital appearance and the prenatal karyotype. So this is something which has been done for those patients where there was an uh, overt abnormality being looked into the, the womb and ultrasound in the pre-birth um, phase. But when you look at the genital appearance now, when you get to know what does a prenatal karyotype look at, in the individual cases, you get to know that there is something wrong. So these are four important criteria I would look at when you suspect a DSD. You see an older child, then you possibly see a child who could be adolescent, or there are other additional criteria. Let's move to the additional criteria. In an older child, the criteria could be many. For example, a previously unrecognized genital ambiguity could be much more visible to you as a child grows from toddler years to adolescent years. An inguinal hernia in a child could be a complete antigen insensitivity syndrome. Very important. So if you give a guy an inguinal hernia in a child, you possibly could have a, a gonad sitting there. You could have a delayed or an incomplete puberty. And that with comes to probably cases that we land up doing as a patient who has got a monthly abdominal pain at the age of 11 and 13 years. She is a female child. Everything looks beautiful and good and she is developing well. But she has monthly abdominal pain and nothing more happens around. Is there a delayed abdominal, delayed puberty or is there a hematocorpus developing inside number one? Or there is no abdominal pain and she has got a primary amenorrhea completely. She could be a case of a, of, of a, a MRK syndrome kind of picture. So we need to look into these aspects. A little older child, a child could be a child of puberty age group, a little later. If you have a breast development in a boy, you rightly know that it is not the testosterone alone which is working around. Therefore, all students would look at that kind of an aspect if you're given one in ward rounds or a child standing with eyes covered down in the OSCE system, which comes up next week. And we look at uh, there's a breast development in a boy. Then your mind moves into the direction of this is possibly a DSD. This is a child of 8 to 15 years and his breast is developing. There are changes happening on the, on the Mullerian side. Looking at the gross or cyclic hematuria in a boy, in, in a boy who has been reared as a boy, and a suprapubic mass or a hematocorpus with breast enlargement after the age of puberty, with a history of hypospadias and undescended gonads, could also be something which could be looked at. So these are all complex kind of things happening. So if it's not in moving in the straight direction, then we will not go into depth of all this, but look at something which is not recognized at birth, can get recognized as a child grows. Or you find something very abnormal is inguinal hernia in a child, which is complete antigen insensitivity. We'll come to that. Or a delayed or incomplete puberty. And that delayed or incomplete puberty is all directly related to the hormones not in sync with what could actually be. Let's look at uh, the DSD and the modern DSD classification by Conte, which is the, the broad classification that exists today compared to what we read in the older editions. And the terminologies therefore disappear. 46XY DSD. Uh, the erstwhile male pseudohermaphrodite is about abnormalities in androgen production or abnormalities in androgen receptor defect, which I talked about androgen insensitivity syndrome, which could be the complete, a partial, or could be a, a, a somewhere a mediocre one. Phi alpha reductase deficiency, another very important aspect, which actually governs and channelizes many of these young boys can be picked up from three to five years of age. So if our eyes know it and we know the subject, we will pick up as early as that in the doubts that we raise. And finally, MIS deficiency, which again allows the Mullerians to continue to work around. So 46 XY DSD is a male pseudohermaphrodite because the androgens are not into that level, which had to be there very classically. So a visual diagnosis gives you that it is a 46 XY DSD or a 46 XX DSD. When we look at the 46 XX DSD, which was a female pseudohermaphrodite terminology of the past. We're looking at disorders of synthesis. We're looking at number one, congenital adrenal hypoplasia. We are uh, looking at 
LH receptor defect, looking at aromatase deficiency, looking at maternal leukomas, and the, the entire baggage of that 46XX, where somewhere down the line, there is that cascade of steroid pathway and the hormone pathway, which has not left the feminine activity to be completely full blown. We look at this important true hermaphrodite of the past as over testicular DSD, where you have both the ovary and the testis as individuals, but the over testis is a common component out here, which actually can be separated in only few of them. So therefore, a fertility and a malignancy risk potential comes into picture when we look at a, a true hermaphrodite or an over testicular DSD by the modern definition. We look at gonadal dysgenesis, then we look at complete and the mixed gonadal dysgenesis, again, common phenomena. And we'll need to look into that as another aspect completely of uh, a DSD, which, uh, which carries a lot of uh, metal when we look at the gender assignment activity because most of them are quite gentle in their childhood. They come over as adolescent and adults and that's where we need to get into the picture of helping them out. And then we come to the sex chromosome DST which are which are for you as uh, Klinefelter syndrome as Turner syndrome are those syndromes which are, mm, are very classically visible to you. The visible sex chromosome DST both comes as short notes. Both also have been in the past put as examination questions around and both are uh, to be discussed uh, in details or in short to take it forward. So when you look at evaluation, when you look at history and clinical examination, when you look at evaluation, there are some conditions which would require an evaluation and birth activity around, which means if you have got a vision of that child which was born at the crossroads with only a penis but no testis around and who could have a very strong hyposperia as component apart from the undescended testis, you look at there is something wrong. And you decided to work up this child because this child could be going in many directions around. So we look at at birth the karyotype, the serum electrolytes, the 17 hydroxy progesterone, sometimes the testosterone, LH and FSH as a large picture which could be recorded at birth. The reason I'm looking at is one of the commonest ones, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which could have bearing in the child's morbidity and mortality at that very age group is important. For example, the commonest cause, uh, the commonest lineage which it takes is is a 17 hydroxy progesterone defect. If that is elevated, then we get to know what kind of an activity it happens around because that helps us segregate that into activities of looking at which pathway does it take. And therefore, we are very, very closely watching that. Very important for us. 17 hydroxy progesterone being normal, then we look into the activities of testosterone and diet testosterone ratios or um, the MIS activity on the lower side or the androgen precursors before and after SCG stimulation and get to understand what kind of an abnormality this is looking into. So we're looking at this lab activity at this point. We find that if there is a failed response to HCG or lower levels of mullerian inhibiting substance in presence of elevated LH and FSH, that means the LH FSH is very high at that point in time and you have got a failed response to SCG in the activity, which means that there could be anarchia, there could be no testes around. Normally, we always look at testes absent externally, will be tapsis absent, will be present, uh, present internally, but that is sometimes missing if you have looked at this aspect very early. Therefore, at birth, some of the labs in this kind of a situation helps us out. No HCG stimulation is needed in the 60 to 90 days of the life because that's where you have the mini puberty, that's where you have the natural gonadotropin surge and with the resultant increased testosterone levels. So, there's an HCG stimulation required in children to look at the activity and probably look at the, the, the gonadal activity. And that could be happening outside these days to help us out to take it forward. When evaluating DSD broadly and in short, we look at the imaging and the procedures that we performed when we look at it. For example, there was a child who looked very normal uh, to a pediatrician. I'm just giving you an example. And the child could not be catheterized for retention of urine. Attempt to catheterize the child was failing. Uh, the bladder was full. And when we did a cystoscopy, the picture is not visible here today to you, is that you find that there is a deep urogenital sinus uh, deep inside, which actually is the vagina. So a uh, very high urogenital sinus in a uh, 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 purely androgenized male uh, uh, phenomena, where somebody thinks it's a male, underdeveloped male, and you try putting a feeding tube, try putting a catheter, and everything goes into the rudimentary vagina and not into the bladder, would actually require a cystoscopy. And looking at from the cystoscopy, every time walk into this rudimentary vagina, but only when you put your, your scope in such a direction that you search, now where is the bladder neck? You find that you're walking through the prostate and you're entering into the bladder. You find the bladder is too full. And therefore, you get to know that a child who could not be catheterized and the feeding tube was disappearing somewhere and probably uh, 
uh, an imaging study picked up that this was a rudimentary vagina sitting inside. Come to that a little later. That that's the kind of aspect which we can see or a presentation of that emergency in the childhood. So ultrasonography of the abdomen, ultrasonography of the pelvis could help us identifying everything. The the anomalous testis which is sitting somewhere high up in the abdomen or has come down into the inguinal region, the Mullerian structures. And therefore, the inguinal pelvic gonads, which could be testis or the over testis and the entire aspect of the pelvis. Looking at genitogram, which evaluates the unigenital sinus, the entry of the urethra and the vagina and the cervical impression, we get to know whether it's a high urogenital sinus or a low urogenital sinus. And that helps us to be looking at what kind of a vagina will create, whether it's just an enlargement of the opening or whether it will be more than that, whether it will be full creation how to dismantle the urogenital sinus from the urethra, etc. The genitogram gives us an initial idea as we move forward towards reconstruction in future. MRI for pelvic anatomy, MRI for gonadal presence is more in the MR Kate syndrome group, which I continue to see and probably not in childhood in many patients, unless you have got bilateral undescended testis and you don't have an NCG stimulation looking at an anorchia, then you want to know where are these testis because ultrasound may not be easily easy to pick up. Therefore, under, under, an, under an anesthesia and MRI in the childhood. Otherwise, uh, we have done MRI more in, in, the, uh, in the adolescent age group where we have found that the gonadal absence, the uterine absence, uh, gonadal presence with uterine and vaginal absence and diagnosing as an MRK syndrome became much easier in a 46XX girl. So knowing the pelvic anatomy, knowing the gonadal presence, the MRI is much stronger compared to an observer-oriented investigation like the ultrasonography. And then looking at those interventions or procedures, which also happen as a part of evaluation, could be a cystoscopy and anesthesia, a vaginoscopy, which happens parallel because you picked up a rudimentary or a shallow vagina, it measures the urogenital sinus, it measures the future attempt to reconstruction that we will do. So every investigation, every evaluation is linked to the future. And therefore, all the impressions need to be recorded very well. And that is a very important thing. You will look at that. Your pediatrician colleagues have recorded everything on the day of birth, on the follow-ups. And that helps you to look at the anatomy and the probably the kind of growth, the kind of handholding and the kind of parentage the child has had. So all these needs to be recorded. And finally, the laparoscopy, for, gone are the eras of open. So laparoscopy for the evaluation, laparoscopy for the gonadal biopsies. And that helps us to take this large picture of the DSD overall as a urologist understanding it. So uh, hormones, the labs, looking at hormones and stimulations as required, identifying criteria as difficult as the CAH of the kind which could trouble us in the sex steroid pathway and create as a neonatal emergency. Looking at the imagings, looking at possible interventions required towards evaluation only and not towards reconstruction in a child at that age group. Unless something is life-threatening, none of them are life-threatening other than the CAH group, everything can be managed and looked at and probably planned out. Let's look at the individuals of them right now. We're looking at 46X um, and we're looking at the most common DSD at this point in time. It means we are looking at 46X. The most common DSD, congenital adrenal hypoplasia happens to be its most common form I was alluding to. And 21 hydroxylase is the most common defect causing the entire aspect around. 11 hydroxylase deficiency is associated with severe hypertension in the child. So when we look at this as a CAH in child, we are very, very aware that involving multiple teams. We take the front, but at the same time, look at the presentation of the child is almost a female fetus, female child, muscularized by overproduction of adrenal androgens or the precursion of that in the lineage of the sex steroid pathway because one enzyme gets blocked. The other uh, byproducts going to different lineage become much, much stronger. And therefore, other kind of androgens and precursors could be developing in very high levels around. They could be either endogenous or could be exogenous. Endogenous are the enzyme deficiencies in a steroid pathway. So the 11 got probably deranged. It will be more in the region of the 17, which actually gets more active and then the 21 kind of thing around. So exogenous, as I said in the beginning, could be maternal hormones or could be maternal tumors, which could be bringing about more amount of hormones leading to that kind of a overproduction of adrenal androgens and a musculation of a female child in a congenital adrenal hyperplasia, the commonest of the C of the DSD or the 46X side. We're looking at the ovary and Mullerian derivatives are completely normal. That's what it is. And therefore, a female child. The sexual ambiguity depends and it's limited to the musculization of the external genitalia and the urogenital sinus. Therefore, I said it could be very high urogenital sinus or it could be very low urogenital sinus on a clinical examination, your examination under anesthesia. The review of musculation is determined by the stage of differentiation, the time of exposure. So, time of exposure as early as it happens in the early times 
it could possibly be more severe compared to a late stage of uh, exposure and therefore a late differentiation. So 46XX DSD, the most common DSD, is something where the presentation is of a feminine kind of a picture with various internal structures or the ovarian mullerian structures being normal, but the sexual ambiguity is visible on face because there's so much of overproduction of the adrenal androgens and musculation of the child. It could sometimes present with the milder forms. We have seen that in adolescents. We've seen that in adults. We'll come to those cases in a due course of time. When we are looking at congenital adrenal hyperplasia that we're discussing that, the management becomes extremely important for the intensivist, the pediatrician, the, uh, the gynecologist who has actually delivered the child, and the teams which take forward while we stand on the timelines of the laws and look at how to take it forward as time goes by. So initial treatment obviously is a dehydrated and a salt lost child, electrolyte and fluid therapy. The crooks will be mineral corticoid replacement as required in intensive care. Glucocoid corticoid replacement is as needed on a PRN basis on confirmed diagnosis of the kind of requirement and the kind of enzymes which are deficient. And then comes the surgical decisions in congenital adrenal hepatitis. So decisions are, remember, made by parents. Decisions are made by parents, but yes, on the most expert advice of dedicated team, the team could today be here, but the parents and the child could travel somewhere else. Therefore, an expert advice by a dedicated team, reaching at a consensus across the table and having a very transparent plan, a very important aspect when you take up this subject, because it's important to be very transparent on understanding what we in initially initial lines that it said, there's no way we could guess what could happen in future. And therefore, hand-holding that component on start and then probably taking it forward to surgical expertise. So what are the three surgeries or the surgical components in congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is given at adolescence or an adulthood? It depends completely on what we take forward. So the urethroplasty and the vaginoplasty, which could help us create separate orifices, externalize the vaginal opening or enlarge the vaginal opening depends on whether it's a high kind of a urogenital sinus or a low kind of urogenital sinus is an important aspect because the child is going to grow. The child is going to be living that dream where the, the clitoris could be looking quite different for a girl child to be going to the school. And that's something, a component which has to be looked at individually. The parents have to be explained many a times biased by the society and the social nature of the kind of lifestyle we lead in our country and the kind of students, kind of patients we could see coming from hinterland and from rural areas, the decision many a times may switch in a different direction. And therefore, we need to be very, very cautious that the parents make a decision only by a consensus and understanding around. So they don't convert this into a male child. And that's something which I wanted to talk to you on. That's a very practical kind of a happening. But the next becomes a clitoroplasty, which is a nerve sparing technique where we maintain the sensitivity of the, of the organ. These children could actually have very strong erections even in childhood. The girls who lie down here at the age of three, five, seven have such strong erections. The movement of the clitoris as an erection it could be quite embarrassing for the mother and for the peers and the kind of her growth and her whole entire gender identity on herself. And that's where came the sex of rearing. Her gender comes in a role here at the age of three, five, seven, where she understands that I have got a male organ. And that rearing can be completely different. And therefore, the, the rulings in, in the country allow us to look at these aspects with an understanding where we don't break and break the law kind of thing. You know. Feminizing genitoplasty and labioplasty are surgeries not necessarily always taken up in childhood because they would require corrections and recorrections compared to what was done in the, in the past is not taken up anymore. So that's one aspect of it. We move on to 46XYDSD, testicular, defective testicular development androgen production or androgen activity. Any of these three components, either the development in the very early stage, right from the six week SRY gene or the production because the testes didn't grow up into a full seed to a full product or the androgen activity in the receptors, any of them gone wrong, could lead to a 46XY DSD. That means there's abnormality in testicular development, a defect in androgen production, which could be enzyme defects, like the one we looked at as a five alpha reductase inhibition, or it could be defects in the androgen receptor function, which could be uh, androgen insensitivity syndrome, or they could be miscellaneous of the persistent Mullerian duct syndrome and vanishing testis syndrome and a whole lot of that kind of thing. Uh, we move forward and look at the five alpha reductase deficiency, the one I alluded to on the commoner side of the 46XY. Typically, a child presenting at the three to five years age, we picked up around seven to 10 in the last two decades. And I look at when we see a child, we don't get to see so many we look at a severe degree of hypospadias and not necessarily always we'll be correcting it, understanding the subject because the phallus could be still so smaller for the size. That's where eyes look at it. 
the scrotum could be grossly bifid and there could be bilateral undescended testis. We did talk about this in the criteria of the production or criteria of formation of DSD. If you have somebody with a smaller size phallus for that age, if you have a complete bifid scrotum, if you have bilateral undescended testis of the picture that I will show you soon, it possibly looks like that we are dealing with somebody who has to be evaluated more. And the final diagnosis comes only by a hormonal evaluation, an evaluation which is important. The FISH technique uh, reveals the 46XY and presence of SRY gene on the Y chromosome. And the testosterone and diatotestosterone levels are elevated and therefore the ratio is obviously different. And at puberty, if you see the same child from three to five years at puberty, the clinical features do prevail. That means the gonads may have descended. The scrotum must have become hyperpigmented like a male child. The scrotal rage may have developed. The phallic length might have improved. But all of them lag compared to the peers of the same sex who are actually growing and probably now going out of their uh, parents' perception and dreams and vision where the child is not growing. So if a child is not growing, let's get into that picture. You have a male child where a mother says that this child is 14 to 16 years old. Her brother at that point in time, her, sorry, his brother at that point in time, five years, eight years ago, grew very well. His organs grew very well, but this child has not grown at the age of 14 to 16 years. You would not wait any longer. There's also, is there a time to do a stimulation test or you would identify him as one and look at what kind of stimulus would you give is such an important aspect. So at puberty, clinical features prevail. Both gonads may descend, scrotum may develop, hyperpigmented and scrotal may develop. Phallic length also improves, but each of them stay behind than their peers. It possibly is a file for their test deficiency. In any of the children whom you wanted to wait in a pre-pubertal era, thinking that at puberty, things will develop. That's where the hormonal evaluation could have helped. So if you have a suspicion of a child who is probably looking at file for heritage deficiency at the three to five years of presentation, you looked at possibly finding a 46XY, you're finding a presence of SRY gene in the chromosome, you find a testosterone, diet testosterone levels are elevated and you find that the child is at that point in time lesser on the percentile compared to the child children around. You wake up to a phenomenon that we are dealing with a file for heritage deficiency. The enzymes can be studied at that point in time. And look at androgen insensitivity syndrome, another aspect of 46XY, not very uncommon, but the presentation here is a little different. What has happened? Most common uh, uh, cause of 40, uh, 46XY uh, DSD in these individuals is it results from alteration in the androgen receptor gene, and therefore things are a little different. Here, leading to a frame of hormonal resistance and possible three phenotypes. So androgen insensitivity syndrome has revealed the broad legion. I'm still studying it because presentation at different age group has had different kind of connotation. Look at that. It could there be complete androgen insensitivity syndrome or it could be partial androgen insensitivity syndrome. Look at typically laboratory diagnosis is made through elevated levels of LH and testosterone with little or no virilization. So little or no virilization and you've got high hormone levels at this point in time. The issue is therefore at any age of presentation, more so later at the presentation because the parents hesitate, possibly they're not being referred. The issue therefore happens most strongly on the decision of sex assignment. Because the child has already got reared, her name has been imprinted as a girl. The timing of gonadotomic matter, gonadotomic matters a lot. The fertility issues will really come in, psychological outcomes and genetic counseling. And therefore, you looking into aspects of helping this child out will a lot depend on the parents, a lot depends on the child's future and the way the child is actually reared. And that's where the gender role comes into picture. What gender she has lived in when she was actually 46XY. Let's look at the three presentations of androgen insensitivity syndrome, a difficult issue to deal because surgically we deal with it regularly, but the presentation of it can be so difficult. Number one, complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. The diagnosis can be done intrauterine at birth, the childhood or at puberty. It can present any times. There is a low risk of any kind of a, a tumor formation or the kind of tumors which can form before puberty and postponing surgery to after puberty may allow development of spontaneous puberty. So if you have somebody which is complete antigen insensitivity and you look at that, there's a low chances of tumors around, allow the, 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 the functioning to come to a level where there could be chances of spontaneous puberty, assisted obviously if required and the parents agree to that, to give them that spontaneity of puberty developing around. And there's a partial androgen insensitivity syndrome, then the diagnosis is usually at birth due to atypical external genitalia. In partial androgen insensitivity syndrome, the risk of uh, the, the gonadal tumors in approximately 15% of patients, which means bilateral gonadectomy is recommended at the childhood in all individuals who are raised in a female social sex. You can't be keeping them around. 
So the parents understood that this is going to be a female sex and probably you have taken it forward in the journey. That's why this subset of DSD is so much looked into when the parents play an important role because they all you unfortunately usually come late. They are scared. They are probably anxious. They would like to wait and look at how the child develops. Don't forget that uh, the, the, the Bailey and Love and All textbook taught us that we could wait for one year while the testis probably comes down fully. And that one year could be a huge amount of difference happening in these kind of patients if you have not done a proper evaluation, workup, ultrasounds, hormone and probably enzyme profiles. And a mixed kind of situation, the diagnosis should be considered in cases of pubertal gynecomastia and in cases of male infertility. So in those situations which are milder forms, which the diagnosis could be considered and probably this would only be picked up, as I said, in the pubertal age group where you and I as urologists do that baton take over from, the, from our pediatric colleagues and take it to adulthood. We hold the strongest baton in the fourth round. So for males with partial angiogenesis insensitivity, the testes should be placed in the scrotum and regularly monitored if you have decided not to do a gonadectomy. As you do for all middle-aged and adult children who's probably the, the, the gonads have not come down and you want to keep them so that you want to get them the proper spontaneous puberty. In angiogenesis insensitivity syndrome, therefore, gender identity usually follows a sex of hearing. I told you that. It is such an important aspect that these are delayed cases. The quality of sexual life, the sexual functioning, the quality of life can be slightly compromised and an important issues for keeping patients in psychological care. Because whatever you do beyond that at late puberty compared to what you do in adulthood may not sometimes stand the test of time. Therefore, a psychological care of keeping them completely promised that this all can happen to create a genital of a male kind at the age of 12 and 14 may not last a lifetime when he becomes an adult. And these are subjects which are still evolving, evolving both for colleagues like you and me evolving also. Therefore, the subject carries an ambiguity all the time. Let's move quickly to over-testicular DSD or two hermaphrodite. And both ovarian and testicular tissues are available. The over-testis is a common gonad out here. Presentation of ambiguous genitalia with uh, the ranges of phallic size, which varies anything from a minimal labioscrotal fusion on one side to a one or either palpable gonad. Most common is testis and ovary on one side and over testis on the contralateral side. At laparotomy or laparoscopy, you actually find the uterus is often present. So you're getting into a picture where there's a uterine presence, there's a over testis on one side or the polytestis ovary on the opposite side. The internal ductal system depends on the ipsilateral test system of propendus. I told you this is completely a lateralization in embryology. The side on which the ductal system develops a lot depends on the hormonal profile of that part because out here it's over testicular. So whichever has got a larger preponderance, the ductal system therefore belongs to the Wolfian system or the Mullerian system. And the most common karyotype is 46XX, but mosaics are common. When you look at over testicular DSD or two hermaphrodite, something comes very strongly into picture. Both malignancy risk and fertility potential, which we did talk on the other aspects also. Now here the risk of malignancy is low as ovarian tissue is normal and the testicular germ cells are much lower. So the worry here about a, a tumor is much lower, a malignancy is much lower. The ovarian function is normal and therefore fertility is possible if the testicular tissue is removed and the uterus is normal. Compared to testicular tissue being abnormal and fertility not possible for a male child out there. Separation of ovary and testicular tissue may not be as possible as I told you. And therefore, sometimes testicular tissue has been removed because they are on a smaller side and they cause, don't cause germ tissue. Touching unfiltered syndrome, the males at least with one Y chromosome and at least two XX chromosomes and therefore 46 XXY. Seminiferous tubules degenerate and the degeneration leads to hyalinization of these seminiferous tubules. Decreased androgen production impairs normal secondary sexual development. And out here, there are two important aspects of these males. Testis and gynecomastia, almost always picked up in their adolescence and adulthood. So in adolescence, you find that the testis are firm but smaller. The leading cells are predominant here, which are hyalinized. Uh, they're predominant compared to the semiferous tubules, which are hyalinized. The offer to them or the hope to them is micro TCA in adulthood because spermatozoa can be retrieved in best of hands on micro TCA in 40 to 50 percent of individuals. That means the best chances are in younger men compared to elderly or compared to later in life. There's increased risk of gonadal neoplasms. And for all our colleagues who are in, in, in for the student days, leading cell tumors, Sertoli cell tumor, and extra gonadal germ cell tumors are common. And therefore, it's recommended that very routine testicular examination in post pubertal era is looked at them very, very closely. Gynecomastia could be eight times carrying the risk of malignancy compared to a normal male. And therefore, surveillance, many a times because the breast is enlarging, 
breast reduction surgery is a part and parcel of a therapy that is given to them. Apart from keeping the psychological intact, we're also looking at their malignancies. I come to Turner syndrome very quickly, 45 XO. The facial features are visible. They are all shorter with ptosis and hypotelism. The body features are all about shorter neck, the web neck, white space nipples, broad chest. Reportive tract is about streak gonads, something which we need to be aware of. Amenorrhea and infertility, and they have associated anomalies urologically with horseshoe kidneys and dysgeminomas. So those are Turner syndromes. These girls actually grow up to a point in time. That's where the life gets very difficult. Friends, we are making a diagnosis of DSD and moving forward to treat them, which was by a good history and clinical examination, which happened to be from the past, from the days of our teachers who taught till today, strongest foundation pillars. Supplementation of that, of examination is latest karyotyping, imaging techniques, the hormonal assays, a gonadal biopsy and endoscopy and laparoscopy. Let us not stay back and let's not hesitate to move forward on this examination evaluation to a point in time to not guess the sex of the child, but go down to the defect that has happened to pick them up in childhood so that when the baton crossing takes over to adolescence or before that, we have moved on all the hormone aspects, the parental aspect so that we can give them the care of surgical assignment and care. That's what is important. Recording of typical features on the first genital examination by you and me or our colleagues which continue to do and you look at those thick files which our pediatric colleagues do pass. The multidisciplinary teams on the workup is always important. Involving parents and families should not be forgotten just because we are masters and practitioners of the art and timely and planned surveillance and interventions are completely a rule on this subject. Friends, we're moving quickly on to this and looking at either they could be completely absent or they could be abundant. If they're abundant, we would probably operate them and remove the abundance of it. But if they're absent, we will not move very quickly. That is what an important aspect of learning is. You, you can see a child is born with aphalia. There's no penis. His scrotum is well developed. He passes urine through the urethra, which opens in the rectum. He is getting recurrent UTIs because of the rectal bacteria hitting his kidneys as a result of ascending pyelonephritis. That's where we look at if he's getting ascending pyelonephritis as a result of opening in the rectum of the urethra. You may only do a cutback and bring the urethra out of the anterior rectal wall so it doesn't develop ascending pyelonephritis and urosepsis. That's what is allowed. Rest of it may probably not help you because you got the urethra in a location where it doesn't develop light threatening urosepsis. Now you got to wait and give them a chance because you got to look at the workup of this subject because adulthood cannot be converted in childhood by doing surgeries of reconstruction assignment. But if you have got extras, you're allowed to remove and you should remove because that's where a psychological impact happens. So if absent, it's a psychological care and handholding. If it is too much, then probably removing to give them a psychological care. For example, this child which was born with Duplication of everything you can see from the bladder, though God suddenly forgot that not only two kidneys, two bladders were given, two urethra, two penis. The child got underwent a surgery. I happened to be part of this uh, way back in a different country. And we looked at the child probably developing things around. The child now has grown up during the years and probably has got uh, testosterone therapy as a part of his work. We will teaching the subject by some case reports before we come to an end. We're looking at somebody who was brought as a female child till the age of 18 which means you are dealing with androgen insensitivity syndrome. She was reared as a female child, and that's where the androgen picture came in. She was 46XY. I didn't talk about the karyotyping. On evaluation, ultrasound done late in life, intra-abdominal testes, which have actually grown very well. Scrotum is ill developed as labia majora and micropenis looks like a clitoris. Now that you cannot give her a male because her entire karyotype is female, very important. You need to give her what she wants. So when I asked across this table, what do you want to be? She says, I've been a female. My name is S and I want to continue to say S. So she underwent bilateral ocherectomy and a sigmoid vaginoplasty. Her vagina could not stand the test of our clinical evaluation and giving just dilatation or a cutback. We had to give her a proper sigmoid vaginoplasty. So giving an idea about the case we had talked about. She's four years young girl. She's being reared as a female. She's, a, she's now become five. She's reared as female. Her name is baby Shanti. She goes to a girl's school. She wears frocks and skirt. Which mother on earth can make up much difference compared to you and me at a very cursory look in a young girl? She passes urine well, not major trouble, but she had got hernia. We had talked about this. I suspect a child who has got a hernia. She had had a hernioplasty on 17th November on one day, four years ago, and she had intra-abdominal testing. The paratic surgeon called me and said, what do you think? I said, just hang on. We did a karyotype. She was 46XY. The sex of rearing is a girl, but she is a male. Remember, that is an age group where the Madras High Court brought about a wonderful ruling where we probably would need to look at the psychology of the child also 
That's where, apart from parents, the child comes into picture and the baton is therefore not crossed. We got to wait till the point in time the child understands the subject to take it forward. Quickly moving on, I said congenital adrenal hyperplasia can be dangerous probably at the day of birth or in neonate. But look at that. Somebody presents at the age of 15 years. Massively hypertrophic clitoris mimicking a male organ. It's a pressing on the urethra leading to retention of it. That means the milder form, the hormone is behave, probably behaved a little differently compared to what could have happened around. She undergoes a reduction clitoroplasty and after all this has happened, she probably has got married right now. She had a sensate reduction nerve sparing clitoroplasty and had a normal size organ. Her vagina was acceptable. We could create the vaginal opening because this was a lower sinus. Her urethra was uh, separated from the, the, the urogenital sinus and she came out well. She's married during this very pandemic, uh, approximately 11 years after we saw her. Uh, Looking at somebody else, 21 years old female, out here, the presentation is a little different. We don't go into this when we look at vaginoplasty, which is not there, which is missing as a part of the Mullerian absence around. We look at somebody here who is case 7, a 16-year-old, reared as a female. But when she grows as an adult, then we find that this is all there. The kind of situation which we find where a feminine uh, production come in and file for rep test deficiency. So that is an aspect which we need to wake up. Most of our patients in urological practice would come at that level where they would come with this kind of a confusion earlier in the pre-pubertal or the pubertal era. And that's where you need to make a decision. Doing a karyotype, understanding the parent psyche. And that's where, unfortunately, if you have not picked them in real childhood, the gender identity role plays so much. They've already been reared by a kind of sex of rearing. Look at the dilemmas which we look at these two important aspects, again, presenting as adolescents. Reared as typically genotypically female, but she's 46 XY, uh, androgen insensitivity syndrome. The very look talks about ambiguous or atypical genitalia. And therefore, we'll work up and take her forward. While somebody is reared as a male, but genotypically is 46 XX, a contraction, just because this was a child who was actually getting an erection the mother thought that's fine. The testis could be inside and this erection is good enough for me to continue forward. So friends, taking the subject forward, a little bit of a movement quickly. Let's not forget two important things which come late in life, which means vaginal atresia and MRKH syndrome. They present, unfortunately, in adolescents. For a girl child, there's not much which can be presenting around. Lower abdominal pain for last five months and has a hematometra minus hematocolpus has a hematocolpus, no hematometra, which means that she has got at this point in time something which requires a sigmoid vaginoplasty. The vagina is missing, something which we do open surgeries. We bring about a vaginoplasty with an intestinal segment. Gynecologists do a different continue altogether. Or we take it forward to the next level where we probably give them a, a segment of performance, look at doing a colposcopies and following it up. Compared to somebody whom I have shown you, that is something out of question because we need to look into it. Friends, we're changing the goalposts as we understand more. It is, it is not possible to show all the surgeries in a short while because I was opening it to students, but we operate all such patients presenting in adulthood and adolescence. The childhood surgeries are almost over unless it's a life-threatening kind of an activity. The aim is to improve the quality of life when they grow up. They improve their mental quality of life because they understand themselves very well. And therefore, when we look at this large picture, which I showed you as an algorithm, in the whole one hour of the discussion, we got to look at each and every aspect of this, whether they are androgenized or whether under-masculinized, whether they are partial or whether they have non-adrenal or adrenal source. And therefore, look into each aspect around. And therefore, re-evaluation, looking at a teamwork, identifying and ascribing somebody to a teamwork is very important. It is important that it gets a cautious acceptance by our colleagues, urologists. We know that the subject of this has not been touched very strongly, but now that the positivity of the subject has taken forward, now that we know more about the subject and the society is accepting it, patients are coming around, they need to be seen, they need to be evaluated. This may not be an examination case all the time, but all good things like what USI and ISC today has done is towards the future of these children because many of our colleague students who today will pass the exam would probably take the subject forward of reconstruction, handholding and identifying them and taking it forward. So them standing on a very strong rope, not knowing which side to tilt, is not their job. It's also not the job of the parents. A consensus is arriven partly because many a times we see them late, but we need to look at the winds of change and the wings of change. We got to help them in that. Therefore, impossible to possible truly can be done by us as urologists because by the time we come to work around that, we need to reincarnate ourselves. We need to re-empower. Finally, they should not be left as 10% human. We can see farther than the ancient because the subject has always been there, but it is our teachers who have actually been giants in the field of medicine taking this subject again and again to the highest possible. I need to come to a close because this was to be taken not to a surgical, but as an aspect because 
Magic is something each of us as urologists can make because it is not me or you alone. It is possibly the management or a teamwork or a dream work which can be done combined. Living in that stress, living in bringing about an awareness which can only be a game changer. Is thinking about the box of this subject which possibly is relegated to the last day of every conference and every work. Friends, I come to a close on a subject of life-saving, life-changing, life-extending and life-modifying treatment. For sick people who are sick because the disease is not yet, yet visible and needy because the organs have not been in right approach. Bringing them back to an active and fuller life will only happen when we handle the subject, the parents, and take it forward to the highest possible level. Apologies that I did not put everything around because this is a subject where our student colleagues would take it forward as a stimulatory advice. Thank you so much, USI ISU. I'm ready to take questions if there are any and probably open the subject for future. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. I think I was just looking at the chat box, the constant watch. There are no questions. Just let me see. Uh, the first question is from Dr. Lakshman Prabhu. Is it correct to say that sex of rearing is pivotal in gender correction surgeries? Kamal should become Kamal and Kamala remains Kamala. Dr. Lakshman Prabhu, good evening. Thank you so much for being there and holding this subject and strongly giving it to the students. Yes, the reason is uh, the Madras High Court came up with a ruling five years ago and we are the only country in the world other than two small European countries where the rules have not yet been entertained. Is that the pediatricians don't operate this case unless there is anything which is called as uh, a threat to life. We're not allowed by the Madras High Court ruling, which means that pre-pubertal surgeries are not happening anymore. It was happening in that era where corrections and discards were happening and we would not take up those scarred things around. So sex of rearing is such an important aspect. And therefore, the awareness goes beyond uh, to all the ambassadors on the subject today who actually are our colleagues in urology who are students who will be our, our own peers tomorrow. Because I think it needs to percolate to the society which has opened up. It's a difficult subject. The sex of rearing or so-called the gender aspect which takes such an important aspect Today is more important than in what it was in the past. Yesterday, which could be decades earlier, the aspect was I as a urologist or I as a pediatric surgeon could decide and tell them this is how it is. One plus one equal to two as mathematics. That sadly does not happen today. So the sex of reading is a very, very important aspect. So Kamal should stay Kamal, not necessarily because you may have to do corrections. But many a times when you wake up the family and make them understand that creation of a male genitalia or creation of a female external genitalia there are huge differences. So uh, that will be handheld and therefore handholding better in the earlier years of life as a pediatric urologist, as a pediatrician, as a psychotherapist, as a clinical psychologist, and as urologists that many of us do take up this subject when we are called upon as an expert witness, I think we take the subject heavily forward. So this is possible that uh, Kamal may stay Kamal, but if given a chance, if the parents understand it well, Today, Kamal could become Kamla and Kamla could become Kamal because that will be the right approach to the right patient. So, right approach to right patient will be required. He adds on to ask, uh, have you seen persons affected with uh, these disorders uh, remain as uh, social discards? In that's a sad part. Yeah, that's a great question, Dr. Arun, and this a great question, Dr. Prabhu, that this is the, the saddest part of the entire subject. This subject doesn't require a laser, doesn't get a, a medicine, doesn't get an abiraterone kind of thing, which means that this subject has not moved in its uh, moment of development on the urological side, on the side of a man and machine. And therefore, many of them stay discards of the past because they've undergone surgeries which have failed because they compare with the peers. It was given as a chance that they could get an adult organ in childhood or adult organ in adolescence. And therefore, there's so much goes into the psych. And therefore, handholding this subject is important because many of these uh, discards, so-called discards, which is possibly a very tough term to be using, using today, do come these days. They come in. I see patients in the age of 30s and 40s having undergone two surgeries in the past. And we are looking at that as many centers do open up in the country with reconstructive urologists that these discards will not say discards. But the discards of the past, they continue to stay as discards because they don't, can't realize their dream or possibly hey, holding the baton of Single to double. That means they can't marry themselves anymore. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay. Uh, I think, uh, uh, just let me have a look again. There's, uh... yeah. Therefore, Dr. Arun, just uh, to add. He, yeah, he has thank you for a comprehensive coverage of uh, a very cryptic topic. And um, I'll also, on behalf of 
USAISU will take this opportunity to thank you for a very, very excellent day. Uh, if, I, if I have to just uh, recall from the slide one to the end slide, every slide was full of messages. Uh, right from the way we started with the etiopathology, the, the classification, and they nicely put the term atypical development of uh, the genetic gonadal and the anatomical sex. If these three terms, uh, they can just keep in the mind and keep the differential diagnosis in their mind and half the job is over. Uh, uh, so nicely was the slides put up for the evaluation, uh, which included uh, the routine investigation and the, the sectional imaging along with the endoscopic. I think the management part of the common scenario which we see in our hospital has been very nicely discussed in the uh, case scenarios which you have put. The seven or eight case scenarios, the common presentation which we uh, see in our uh, hospital setting or institution settings. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's right that you have not covered uh, the, what you can say, a very uh, reconstructive surgery in detail or the videos and all that. But I think uh, as, as a teacher, we don't expect the residents to uh, uh, know about all these major reconstructions. We need, we just know want them to know about the principles of the diagnosis, how you do, how, how you will manage, and all that. And I think you have nicely covered the whole scenario. I am very sure that those who have not read this topic uh, just before going for the exam, I think practicals are being held in many university exams. Those who who find this uh, reading this in your book very difficult. If they go back to the archives and just uh, listen this uh, lecture carefully, and after two three days when it is put on the USA TV, it will be great, and uh, and they can often refer again and again if, if they have any problem in revising this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sanjay. And uh, there are no more questions. I'll just ask Dr. Ajeev so that I'll invite him for uh, closing remarks, and then we'll call up the day. And for the residents, the link is open for the quiz. Uh, uh, please, you can um, just log in and uh, finish the quiz section also. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Arun. And a big thank you to Dr. Uh, Sanjay Pandey. This is um, one important uh, subject on which the Supreme Court has also given the ruling in 2014. And now this is a legal subject, legally accepted uh, subject in India. And, and uh, it is very categorically uh, told by the two uh, judge bench of the Supreme Court on 15th April uh, 2014, that uh, it is not only a, a medical or social problem, it is a question of human right. And uh, in 2011, uh, as uh, Dr. Sanjay has uh, enumerated all the aspects of uh, clinical aspects and uh, of uh, transgender or third gender or whatever you say that uh, uh, medically, but for the social uh, purpose, it, it was very uh, important to recognize how many transgender or third gender or gender dysphoria are in India. And in the census of 2011, five lakh uh, uh, people were identified in India and uh, now in 2021 delayed census it is going to be uh, the uh, household added by, added by third gender that is going to be the part of the census so the question had come uh, in the chat box that uh, what is the social discard or what, what, what is the problem as Dr. Sanjay has already uh, answered but I like to add that this is now legally socially accepted and it is the norm and uh, it has been uh, also we are uh, uh, finding out that uh, as this uh, uh, recognizing uh, this as social problem the literacy where uh, is the average around 70 76 percent in uh, transgender literacy is only uh, 46 percent literacy is who can write and sign so so these people um, uh, need medical treatment. They need uh, uh, re uh, re um, um, def defining the role in the society as the normal uh, uh, population part. And also, Dr. Sanjay Pandey has uh, uh, right uh, rightly explained that uh, what all can be done. 
to bring them as the normal person. This is also a disorder where we are treating so many people if it relates to sex. That doesn't mean that we don't talk about it or we don't do anything. Now coming from... Uh, I, and, and I'll add that uh, I'm the chairman appointed uh, after that order of uh, sex re reassignment committee. And uh, now this is going to be the seven, uh, six, seven years. I'm chairing and deciding that which uh, uh, um, uh, patient uh, in the multimodality treatment, like uh, psychologist, uh, endocrinologist, urologist, plastic surgeon, all sit together and we are giving the decision that this uh, patient uh, is fit to be operated or reassigned the uh, sexual role in the society. And uh, now coming uh, back to the resident point of view, this is very important subject and uh, residents uh, must have learned a lot and they are uh, they are, they are polishing their knowledge and also they feel sometimes it some some people i have i i know they feel it is very difficult subject some feel that it is uh, not interesting but dr pandey has made the difficult subject simple and uh, not interesting uh, subject, very interesting and uh, very, very relevant. And from the urologist point of view, we all are immensely benefited today by Dr. Sanjay Pandey's lecture, not only resident, but the faculties also. And after dealing with the Maybe I'll, I'll say I was dealing superficially only, but Dr. Sanjay Pandey has reintroduced into the depths of the subject so that uh, we can handle much more uh, uh, better way uh, the subjects and how to make them, uh, the, 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 uh, assign them the proper role their right uh, placed uh, places in the society and uh, they become the part. Now the uh, subject has been uh, adequately deliberated and uh, students are going to now attempt the quiz. And with this, all this background, we continue our efforts uh, for uh, upgrading our uh, um, uh, efforts in Indian School of Urology. Again, I'll... Uh, um, wish you all and I'll, I'll um, giving you the information also that um, in um, the 75th independence year of, uh, of uh, Indian independence, when the prelude to the UCCon 2023 is going to be the just one week before the uh, celebrations in Delhi, this is going to be one of the major subjects in the men's health conference workshop, which we are doing. And I, uh, I, I will be very happy when Dr. Sanjay Pandey is guiding and also planning how to go about this uh, whole uh, exercise. Uh, and we have one year to prepare. And by that time, I think the census is also going to be mature. Today, we are thinking we are dealing with 5 lakh people. But tomorrow, we will know that we are uh, dealing with millions of people who will come open and they will get benefited by the medical knowledge, and science and technology. Thank you very much for today's evening. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Sanjay Pandey and uh, also the, our technical team, Urological Society of India, who is uh, doing wonderful work uh, as the subspecialty um, based functioning of uh, USI. And this uh, COVID has given us the chance to engage everybody in virtual classrooms, uh, distant learning, and uh, this kind of uh, activity, which is becoming more and more popular. This whole exercise will go in the archives of USI. And uh, for that also, we can revisit in, in our archives uh, on internet and uh, get benefited in that time to come also. Any final uh, message by Dr. Sanjay Pandey? So thank you so much, uh, bringing both the subjects of uh, dilemma and confusion and agony uh, together when you did talk about the genders. So these two have connotations in one way, the DSD picked up at childhood and probably taken by your pediatric colleagues, we getting into the picture as urologists, 
our student colleagues taking the subject to highest level with awareness we moving into the society to help more individuals who know it better and finally it has got gender connotations that dr lakshman prabhu did ask i think the subject is was very complex as me and many of my colleagues in the country take the subject forward on the urology circles and create a multifactorial team uh, your own uh, uh, aspect of taking this to national level is created around this makes india move forward much higher from your offices and the offices of usi and iis thank you and a very good evening to all of you thank you dr sanjay pante thank you everybody and uh, good night today thank you thank you thank you sir bye everybody thank you thank you thank you, thank you. bye sir bye